I'm Dale Van Eck from the Adelaide Hills. Truck driver, got an AU Falcon XR6 2001 model and a baby kangaroo. Bought in 2013, this is the daily, since my turbo EB was being a bit of a pain. Just sort of fell in love with the look of it and fell in love with the chassis and decided, you know, BA engines bolt into these physically. So I went for a BA turbo 240 kilowatt engine, six speed manual, and did a lot sort of like that. Just sort of kept it as a street car for a while with coilovers and the brakes and the body kit. But then we took it to a track day and kind of Got used to how well it was on the track for such a big, heavy 1.9 metric ton car. Raced it a bit harder, popped the bottom end, rebuilt it with forged internals, uh, FG turbo for more response, bigger fuel system, intercooler, as you can see. And yeah, we've just been going for more of a drivable track day car, still retaining the drivability of factory with the luxuries of sunroof, aircon, power windows, ABS, CD player. It's been a bit of a trial and error, but it's got a XYZ coilovers all around, a 32 mil adjustable front sway bar, Standard AU Falcon IRS and LSD. It's got a pretty much standard suspension other than just the coilovers, just on a custom wheel alignment. Just messed around with the camber and caster a lot. Had big brakes, eight piston on the front, 350 mil. Stock rear just with dimpled rotors. They've got a brake bias adjuster from Willwood. And it's making about 300 kilowatt at the moment at the rear wheels for a standard T56, still in the standard diff, like I said. And it's been quite reliable other than just turbo issues and boost cut issues. The actual bottom end's been okay since we rebuilt it. Gearbox has been tough as anything. Drive line's never had a failure. And she's consistent. Not really the quickest outright, but still consistent. Most other cars are in the pits when this one's still going around. I still drive to work regularly, still taking on car events. And no one's really used these chassis for circuit racing. A lot of drag racing, a lot of street cars, but not much in actual competitive time attack and circuit. Always like time attack because I love big aero. I like how they push factory chassis to the absolute limit. And I entered a few track days and I was actually a lot quicker than I thought. I was keeping up with some of the more stripped out Hondas, a few R32s and R33s. I'm like, it's not bad for something I could drive to work and weighs nearly two tonnes and is quite interesting looking. So we kind of chased a bit more and I went to World Time Attack and there was an AU out there, basically a retired Viet supercar. And kind of got a bit of inspiration, so I entered Time Attack 2017 in Adelaide. Didn't do too well, we had a lot of boost issues, but it was a learning curve. A lot of people really loved it, seeing a quintessential Australian car out there with thousands of Jap cars and a few Euros. And since then I've kind of built a relationship with Bill and the guys at SA Time Attack and I go out almost every year. Never really been the fastest, but we did fifth outright last year and did the Australia Day Drift Fest Time Attack expression. We we're only a couple seconds off the actual top guys. It was a bit of amusement and it's kind of just pushing it and time attack I like because there's no real rule book. Anything you build, you can find a category to fit into. So you just go over the top with it and that's what I liked about it. I can use an AU Falcon, still race alongside Civics, you know, GDRs and everything. Everyone's quite friendly with it too. There's a bit of competitiveness, but it's not really a, you know, your shit for having such and such car kind of competitive environment. But yeah, we do enjoy a lot of the time attack stuff more than anything. And it's quite safe in the car. You brake it, you just pull off the track and you're not really ruining anyone else's time. Basically, I was in the driver with my mate Ryan back in 2013. Like, I need an plate for it. Everyone knows me now as the guy with the AU Falcon. We started messing around with the AU theme and I remember like, as a kid when AUs came out, the AU doing slogan was used a few times for school and for high school. And I kind of forgot about it until I was going through on Reg OSA and I was checking plates and I thought, I just go over you doing that works. Didn't really think much of it at the time. Yeah, it blew up on the internet, it blew up on memes. You know, everyone just knows there's AU doing the silver AU turbo. There's been a few burnout cars with the same fake plates on it, but this was the one of the originals that I know of as the only one with the registered plates. And back in 2013 I had them and photos ever since then have been doing the rounds of hey, it's at AU doing XR6. <laughs> yeah, the meme just kind of came along a few years ago and I've just played along with it. <laughs> Thought it was great, let's just continue pushing this. <laughs> Basically it was growing up, loved Jap cars, always liked Japanese culture with automotive, time attack drifting. I used to drift when I was 13 and 14 or a Crusader, way back in the G1 days. I loved drifting and kind of followed the inspiration, but I always had Falcons because they were just so much cheaper, easier to build, 
they're just everywhere. But then I kind of fell in love with them in their own funny way. And I said, they're not good cars by any means, but they're a fun car, they're cheap and they're accessible. And you can do anything to them, just most people don't because I find a lot of people are very unoriginal. They see something, so they kind of just copy it. I see various styling points and ideas and think I can manipulate that into a different chassis. And like, I look at Formula One and like high-end motorsports and how their evolution was built down to a lot of the Japanese culture. Why can't I put that into an Australian car? So like the carbon bonnet, the quiet wide wheels of the aggressive offset, but still more a track look rather than an outright stance look. And I've always sort of like, I like mixing cultures together. I love it when you see Jap cars done up like muscle cars and American cars done up like Jap cars. It's sort of standing out in the crowd, not just doing the same 5,000 horsepower AU Falcon with Simmons on it that everyone seems to own. I do find it's the biggest problem with the cars. There's a lot of negativity, especially since social media became such a prevalent thing. But I've kind of worked off it. Diehard Ford guys don't like the carbon bonnet. They don't like the wheels. They don't like the bride race seat. But quite frankly, everything's there for a purpose for me. But I get Jap guys who love it because it's not just slammed on factory wheels. It's not just all power and nothing else. I've tried to keep power to a sort of minimum for a barra. If anyone knows them knows how powerful they can be. But make it drivable, make it useful. You know, just mixing it together a bit. And like, I grew up watching Option DVD, or Option Video back in the days, and magazine, and seeing little NA Civics keeping up with the big boy GDRs. And I always love that, you know, the underdog thing. And Falcon is the underdog of Australia in terms of circuit. <laughs> rather than drag strips, and no one really campaigns them on circuit unless they're in their own series like Viet Supercar. It doesn't throw you back in the seat hard like most of them do, so I can go full boost down mountain roads and still hold a perfect line, and just the way it handles that power so well. The chassis in AU was really developed for what it was, but wasn't like squishy too much. It was BA kind of softened it off when they got the big power engines. AU had a really pissy engines in them, but the chassis really was, has a lot more development available for it. It can go a lot further than what they originally anticipated. And it's got double control arm rear IRS, which is the only Falcon to ever run that. It's got double control arm front end, similar to what Skylines have run for years and a lot of the high end cars. Because the engine's about that much higher than the factory engine, it clips the underside of the bonnet. I thought rather than cutting and shutting, I'll get a bulge bonnet. And I rang a couple of companies and one of them knew of one that was still sitting around. They stopped making them years ago. And they got it to me, but they said, oh, it's got tiger stripes through it. It's not the greatest condition. We'll give it to you for a thousand bucks instead of the 2,000 they're retailing about. Um, SSV over in Sydney, they did it for me. And ever since then, I've been supporting them because they've really helped out with a lot of the body parts on it, the fiberglass and really good guys to deal with. So yeah, I grabbed that and it was one of the only ones getting around with one still. There's a couple, but you don't see them often. Driving a P-plated car with a huge intercooler was never a grand idea. I can assure you of that much. I've been defected twice, got it cleared both times since the guys are reading, so they tend to like it. It's not technically complied, but most of them say it's a factory Ford motor and a factory Ford chassis. You haven't cheapened out on it. It's not like you've dodged it too much. There's no real cut and shut wiring or anything. They are certified with it and they were happy with it. And I've had him pulled over a few times. And probably the best story I ever had was a bike cop pulled me over. And I was like, oh, here we go. I was on my P's still. I was like, yeah, here we go. We're going to Regency tonight, boys. Pop your bonnet for me. And I follow the bonnet and he goes, oh, you've done the barra swap. I've always wanted to do this to my XR6. I got the same one as you. I'm like, and he loved it, he loved the real carbon bonnet. He's like, oh, those brakes are really good. It's great to see you guys doing something with the AU. He goes, I loved these when I was a kid and I still love them now. Good work, mate. Got back on his bike and congratulated me on a good day and drove off. Like, a lot of guys with Falcons go for maximum dyno numbers. And a lot of guys get carried away with it. I tell them I got 300 kilowatt with a built motor and a six speed manual. And they're like, oh, that's not very much because that's just a tune or whatever. And I said, but the difference between tracking a car and having a dyno warrior is a lot of heat and reliability issues. This one is perfect to 300 for its weight. I'd like a bit more, but it holds well. A lot of guys chase the numbers too much and they get carried away and forget about your braking, your handling, and the immense weight these things do weigh. They are not light cars. They're very strong, they're very heavy. Because you don't need massive power. Start with an NA one, and my biggest advice is if you're gonna start with a BA, don't go straight to a turbo. They're problematic when it comes to the track work. Start with an NA and build the chassis up first. And I started with the coilovers and big brakes first, and that's really helped out a lot. And getting the suspension dialed in before I even went to a turbo engine. Now I've got the turbo, it just loves it, it thrives on it. And as I would get more power, I'm gonna to have to change my spring rates and go different wider tires, such and such, and move on from there. Being a limited market, nobody really wants to develop them. And with BA having the factory turbo motor, everyone sort of went straight to them straight away. They were kind of the forgotten generation, but they were the in-between the E-series of the 90s and the BA of the 2000s. And they're that in-between one where you can mix and match quite easily. And no one expects it from them. It's a sleeper without being a sleeper. <laughs>